regret. I clawed my hands inside my pockets, wearing a hole in the fabric, knowing that I was sweating profusely. I hadn't expected to see her here. The knowledge that she'd found out where I lived made her infinitely more dangerous than I'd given her credit for. She was a cobra, dressed as a milkmaid, and looking more delicious than any of the cupcakes on Mom's stall. I swallowed a few times, hoping that my stance was aggressive, not unsure and shaky. I felt shaky. She'd flown all the way out here, somehow able to ambush me on my own soil. And she had back up. Tarquin, the man she claimed to despise, was two paces behind her. Donna, her best friend, stood behind him. Both of them were stony-faced. I felt my feet twitching, like they wanted to betray me and run away. Somewhere, anywhere. In spite of my job, I'd always hated confrontation, especially when I didn't expect it. There was a lick of her lips, the way she gripped her hip with one hand, and how the balmy air tossed around tendrils of her hair. She was a force that ignited me, a burning desire that funny its way inside my veins. I had to get it together, narrow my eyes, and get a grip. She moved towards me, her skirt floating around her, and she looked intimidating. Not the petite, floundering, klutz of a woman I'd met. I had no idea about her. For days I'd been in her company, thinking that sooner or later I had to kiss her, or I'd wind up back here, sitting in my truck, punching my steering wheel and punishing myself. I didn't want to regret not kissing her. And now I regretted ever taking on the job. Hi, Rhett. Why did she sound so cheerful? Why was she smiling? Why were her arms outstretched? She wrapped her arms around me as my own limbs hung at my sides like they were paralyzed. Then her lips came to my ear, a sweet curl at her lips, and the kind of smile that could make a man trawl to the ends of the earth if she asked. I shivered, knowing my pupils were dilated feeling my body respond in ways only she could induce. Hug me back. Put on a show for your mother. Then meet me at your cabin at midnight, you thieving bastard. My blood ran cold. She was good. Really good. A black widow spider. The wolf in sheep's clothing. The ultimate weapon. Her father in younger, female form. Before I got a chance to say... Anything I found myself hugging her back, my mother smiling at us, hands clasped over her heart. Samantha, I don't know where it came from, but if ever there was a moment to appear all kick arse and frosty, it was then. The truth was that nerves made me so nauseous that I rushed to the public loose and vomited, so hard my stomach screamed at me. And the bloody dress was so tight I found myself pulling at the fabric, eventually freed by Tarquin, of all people. You absolutely rocked, taking on Rhett like that. He loosened some of the ribbons, and instead of clambering to protect my modesty in case of an unfortunate nip-slip, I relaxed my shoulders. He wasn't so bad. A little pervy, maybe. But he'd shown I could trust him. And he was besotted with Donna. I feel like a wreck, Tark. Like I was jabbering away. I don't remember a thing. It's the adrenaline. Now did you tell him to meet you? Yeah. I just about remembered that where's Donna? He smiled at me, in the mirror. She's out there keeping tabs on, Red. You know Donna and I will be there? You won't be on your own, lovey. I nodded slowly. Now, now, Samantha, dearest best, and I will take good care of you. He patted me on the back awkwardly. Thanks, Tarquin. I wiped away the one rogue tear, snaking down my cheek and embraced him. The hardness in his trousers made me recoil, in horror. Oh, sorry, dear. That's not for you. I was just imagining Donna riding Winky, like a cowgirl. That line had me laughing till... I was sure what remained of my dress would tear. Leather look leggings on. Cowboy boots on. Smoky eyed makeup perfected. Almost it would have to do. 
When I looked in the mirror, I told myself I was Joan of Arc, or Mary Queen of Scots, Beyonce, or Kim Kardashian. I was a headstrong, confident woman. Rhett wouldn't rattle me. Donna and Tarquin dressed in balaclavas, and I didn't even ask where they got them. I was sure Tarquin had them in his survival bag, and as ridiculous as they looked, I knew they wanted to blend into the tree line, Tarquin with his gun, and Donna with a bottle of hairspray. I had no idea why, till she told me she once sprayed it into her neighbor's eyes, when she thought he was a killer, calling late at night. It turned out he was just warning her there was a gas leak, and the poor bloke couldn't see for four hours. I loved her. I loved them both. Leaving the house my knees felt like jelly, and if horse dog wasn't right by my side, I probably would have fallen over half a dozen times. Donna and Tarquin hugged me as we split up. I didn't want Rhett to see me with my entourage. I had to be the confident ninja, setting out into the night, sure that her own instincts and lightning-fast reflexes would keep the situation under control. Me Jennifer Garner in alias. Donna grinned, squeezing my hands. Be Clarice Starling. Tarquin urged me, patting my shoulder like I was a dog. Go get him, girl. The night was inky and thick and bloody scary. If it wasn't for Rocky flanking me the whole way, I'd have probably run straight back to the house and crawled under a duvet. Horse Dog looked up at me, and it was like he was saying, I'm here, Sam, I've got your back. Or maybe I was delirious with the thought of coming face to face with a man that still made me want to eat him. I reached his cabin quicker than I thought I would, probably because we went at Rocky's pace. I breathed deeply, humming Eye of the Tiger. At Rhett's place, I shut my eyes and visualized Jennifer Lopez on the red carpet, and Scarlett Johansson in, well, any film. I knocked hard on the door three times. A few minutes passed, and then a few more. I looked into the tree line, or where I imagined the tree line would be, hoping to see a glimmer of Donna's torch. Oh, some kind of sign from Tarquin. I was surprised he wasn't tapping out some Morse code message for me. He's not bloody here. I stroked Rocky's head, after almost twenty minutes of waiting in the dark. If I was out here, much longer some wild animal would claim me as their prey. I knocked again, irritation bubbling inside me. I could be sleeping right now. He was probably sat inside sniggering. Or maybe not. I felt cold metal against the small of my back, and I knew what it was, despite my minimal knowledge of guns. But I didn't yelp, or scream, or beg him not to kill me. I didn't need lightning-fast reflexes, or a weapon of my own. Rocky was my savior. Once again, he jumped up at Red, and I heard a thump as he fell on his arse. Reacting quickly, which is amazing for me, I fumbled in the dewy grass for his gun. I could hear cursing, and the dog slobbering all over his rightful owner. I plastered on a grin as I stood above Rhett, hand gripping the silver pistol. Good evening, Rhett. Rhett. My butt was soaked. The dog was soaking me in saliva. Dude needed to brush his teeth, sweet Jesus. He smelled like he'd waded through a swamp, and Samantha stood over me, my personalized, bespoke pistol in her hands. She looked hot smoking, sizzling, throw her on the ground, and ravage her hot. Gone was the milkmaid outfit, and in its place she wore pants that looked like they were a second skin. They hugged her thighs. They shimmered in the pale moonlight. And the girl wore cowboy boots. She knew what she was doing. My gun didn't look out of place in her grip. What do you want? I found myself saying, as I looked up at her, wishing she'd direct her deep brown eyes elsewhere. I tried not to trail my eyes all over her. You know what I want. She rasped in this husky, seductive tone. I got up slowly. She backed off, the gun still trained on me. No sudden moves, please. Aw, oh, you're a dead man. I raised an eyebrow, 
wondering whether this was just a threat. The truth was, I didn't know. She'd gone through great effort to come here. To infiltrate my family. I knew nothing about her. I didn't think she was dangerous, but I wasn't taking that chance. I needed some control back. I moved towards her. She backed off again, gun wavering. Here was my chance. Using simple martial arts, I hooked my foot through her legs, and as she lost her balance, I caught the gun mid-flight. She landed awkwardly on her back, issuing a piercing sound that made Rocky howl like a wolf. You'll leave tomorrow. And if you show your face here again, I promise I'll make you sorry, Samantha. I growled. She whimpered now, and something inside me hurt. I couldn't pinpoint it. Part of me wanted to get down into the dirt and apologize. The other half of me needed to protect my family. Like I'd always done. Christopher Rhett Buell. My shoulders stiffened as I heard my mom's voice. And on instinct I dropped my gun and held up my hands. Flanked by Tarquin and Donna, my mother appeared from the darkness, holding a flashlight, illuminating a face of disappointment. What on God's green earth are you doing? Her voice was high-pitched. She wasn't happy. Her eyes flashed at me, jaw tensed. Samantha groaned again from the lush growth beside the cabin. Mom snatched up my gun, stuffing it into her back pocket as she stared daggers at me and went to my opponent's aid. Son, tonight we stop all this cloak and dagger, secret bullshit. I'd rarely ever heard my mother swear. She meant business. She wasn't a happy bunny. But mom, I heard the whine in my voice and I cringed. Mom, she's a Belvedere, I blurted. Her back was to me, but for a second her muscles tensed, and then just like that she relaxed. I know Rhett, she said matter-of-factly. I know exactly who she is. Rhett. I clawed my hands inside my pockets, wearing a hole in the fabric, knowing that I was sweating profusely. I hadn't expected to see her here. The knowledge that she'd found out where I lived made her infinitely more dangerous than I'd given her credit for. She was a cobra, dressed as a milkmaid, and looking more delicious than any of the cupcakes on Mom's stall. I swallowed a few times, hoping that my stance was aggressive, not unsure and shaky. I felt shaky. She'd flown all the way out here, somehow able to ambush me on my own soil. And she had back up. Tarquin, the man she claimed to despise, was two paces behind her. Donna, her best friend, stood behind him. Both of them were stony-faced. I felt my feet twitching, like they wanted to betray me and run away. Somewhere. Anywhere. In spite of my job, I'd always hated confrontation. Especially when I didn't expect it. There was a lick of her lips, the way she gripped her hip with one hand, and how the balmy air tossed around tendrils of her hair. She was a force that ignited me, a burning desire that funny its way inside my veins. I had to get it together, narrow my eyes, and get a grip. She moved towards me, her skirt floating around her, and she looked intimidating. Not the petite, floundering, klutz of a woman I'd met. I had no idea about her. For days I'd been in her company, thinking that sooner or later, I had to kiss her, or I'd wind up back here, sitting in my truck, punching my steering wheel and punishing myself. I didn't want to regret not kissing her. And now I regretted ever taking on the job. Hi, Rhett. Why did she sound so cheerful? Why was she smiling? Why were her arms outstretched? She wrapped her arms around me as my own limbs hung at my sides like they were paralyzed. Then her lips came to my ear, a sweet curl at her lips, and the kind of smile that could make a man trawl to the ends of the earth if she asked. I shivered, knowing my pupils were dilated feeling my body respond in ways only she could induce. Hug me back. Put on a show for your mother. Then meet me at your cabin at midnight, you thieving bastard. My blood ran cold. 
She was good. Really good. A black widow spider. The wolf in sheep's clothing. The ultimate weapon. Her father in younger, female form. Before I got a chance to say anything I found myself hugging her back, my mother smiling at us, hands clasped over her heart. Samantha, I don't know where it came from, but if ever there was a moment to appear all kick arse and frosty, it was then. The truth was that nerves made me so nauseous that I rushed to the public loose and vomited, so hard my stomach screamed at me. And the bloody dress was so tight I found myself pulling at the fabric, eventually freed by Tarquin, of all people. You absolutely rocked, taking on Rhett like that. He loosened some of the ribbons, and instead of clambering to protect my modesty in case of an unfortunate nip slip, I relaxed my shoulders. He wasn't so bad. A little pervy, maybe. But he'd shown I could trust him. And he was besotted with Donna. I feel like a wreck, Tark. Like I was jabbering away. I don't remember a thing. It's the adrenaline. Now did you tell him to meet you? Yeah. I just about remembered that where's Donna? He smiled at me, in the mirror. She's out there keeping tabs on, Red. You know Donna and I will be there? You won't be on your own, lovey. I nodded slowly. Now, now, Samantha, dearest. Best, and I will take good care of you. He patted me on the back, awkwardly. Thanks, Tarquin. I wiped away the one rogue tear, snaking down my cheek and embraced him. The hardness in his trousers made me recoil, in horror. Oh, sorry, dear. That's not for you. I was just imagining Donna riding Winky, like a cowgirl. That line had me laughing till... I was sure what remained of my dress would tear. Leather look leggings on. Cowboy boots on. Smoky eyed makeup perfected. Almost it would have to do. When I looked in the mirror, I told myself I was Joan of Arc, or Mary Queen of Scots, Beyonce, or Kim Kardashian. I was a headstrong, confident woman. Rhett wouldn't rattle me. Donna and Tarquin dressed in balaclavas, and I didn't even ask where they got them. I was sure Tarquin had them in his survival bag, and as ridiculous as they looked, I knew they wanted to blend into the tree line, Tarquin with his gun, and Donna with a bottle of hairspray. I had no idea why, till she told me she once sprayed it into her neighbor's eyes, when she thought he was a killer, calling late at night. It turned out he was just warning her there was a gas leak and the poor bloke couldn't see for four hours. I loved her. I loved them both. Leaving the house my knees felt like jelly, and if horse dog wasn't right by my side, I probably would have fallen over half a dozen times. Donna and Tarquin hugged me as we split up. I didn't want Rhett to see me with my entourage. I had to be the confident ninja, Setting out into the night, sure that her own instincts and lightning-fast reflexes would keep the situation under control. Me Jennifer Garner in alias. Donna grinned, squeezing my hands. Be Clarice Starling. Tarquin urged me, patting my shoulder like I was a dog. Go get him, girl. The night was inky and thick and bloody scary. If it wasn't for Rocky flanking me the whole way... I'd have probably run straight back to the house and crawled under a duvet. Horse Dog looked up at me, and it was like he was saying, I'm here, Sam, I've got your back. Or maybe I was delirious with the thought of coming face to face with a man that still made me want to eat him. I reached his cabin quicker than I thought I would, probably because we went at Rocky's pace. I breathed deeply, humming Eye of the Tiger. At Rhett's place, I shut my eyes and visualized Jennifer Lopez on the red carpet, and Scarlett Johansson in, well, any film. I knocked hard on the door three times. A few minutes passed, and then a few more. I looked into the tree line, or where I imagined the tree line would be, hoping to see a glimmer of Donna's torch. Oh, some kind of sign from Tarquin. I was surprised he wasn't tapping out some Morse code message for me. He's not bloody here. 
I stroked Rocky's head, after almost twenty minutes of waiting in the dark. If I was out here, much longer some wild animal would claim me as their prey. I knocked again, irritation bubbling inside me. I could be sleeping right now. He was probably sat inside sniggering. Or maybe not. I felt cold metal against the small of my back, and I knew what it was, despite my minimal knowledge of guns. But I didn't yelp, or scream, or beg him not to kill me. I didn't need lightning-fast reflexes, or a weapon of my own. Rocky was my savior. Once again, he jumped up at Red, and I heard a thump as he fell on his arse. Reacting quickly, which is amazing for me, I fumbled in the dewy grass for his gun. I could hear cursing, and the dog slobbering all over his rightful owner. I plastered on a grin as I stood above Rhett, hand gripping the silver pistol. Good evening, Rhett. Rhett. My butt was soaked. The dog was soaking me in saliva. Dude needed to brush his teeth, sweet Jesus. He smelled like he'd waded through a swamp, and Samantha stood over me, my personalized, bespoke pistol in her hands. She looked hot. Smoking, sizzling, throw her on the ground and ravage her hot. Gone was the milkmaid outfit, and in its place she wore pants that looked like they were a second skin. They hugged her thighs. They shimmered in the pale moonlight. And the girl wore cowboy boots. She knew what she was doing. My gun didn't look out of place in her grip. What do you want? I found myself saying, as I looked up at her, wishing she'd direct her deep brown eyes elsewhere. I tried not to trail my eyes all over her. You know what I want. She rasped, in this husky, seductive tone. I got up slowly. She backed off, the gun still trained on me. No sudden moves, please. Aw, oh, you're a dead man. I raised an eyebrow, wondering whether this was just a threat. The truth was, I didn't know. She'd gone through great effort to come here. To infiltrate my family. I knew nothing about her. I didn't think she was dangerous, but I wasn't taking that chance. I needed some control back. I moved towards her. She backed off again, gun wavering. Here was my chance. Using simple martial arts, I hooked my foot through her legs, and as she lost her balance, I caught the gun mid-flight. She landed awkwardly on her back, issuing a piercing sound that made Rocky howl like a wolf. You'll leave tomorrow. And if you show your face here again I promise I'll make you sorry, Samantha. I growled. She whimpered now, and something inside me hurt. I couldn't pinpoint it. Part of me wanted to get down into the dirt and apologize. The other half of me needed to protect my family. Like I'd always done. Christopher Rhett Buell. My shoulders stiffened as I heard my mom's voice, and on instinct I dropped my gun and held up my hands. Flanked by Tarquin and Donna, my mother appeared from the darkness, holding a flashlight, illuminating a face of disappointment. What on God's green earth are you doing? Her voice was high-pitched. She wasn't happy. Her eyes flashed at me, jaw tensed. Samantha groaned again from the lush growth beside the cabin. Mom snatched up my gun, stuffing it into her back pocket, as she stared daggers at me and went to my opponent's aid. Son, tonight we stop all this cloak and dagger, secret bullshit. I'd rarely ever heard my mother swear. She meant business. She wasn't a happy bunny. But Mom, I heard the whine in my voice and I cringed. Mom, she's a Belvedere, I blurted. Her back was to me, but for a second her muscles tensed, and then just like that she relaxed. I know Rhett, she said matter-of-factly. I know exactly who she is, Samantha. Your passport fell from the kitchen table. Jeannie blushed apologetically, squeezing my arm. I saw your name when I picked it up. I blinked at her, and then at Rhett who no longer held a firearm, but looked viciously menacing. He might as well be holding an AK-47. Behind me, 
I heard Tarquin come to the realization I was quickly coming to. My father was the reason why the Buells had to move. He'd taken everything from them. The Belvedere Way. I was under no illusion that my father had dabbled in underhand tactics to get his own way. This was typically him. I'd just never been a witness to the fallout before or how his actions had affected real people. I'm sorry, I said, weakly, facing Jeannie. She nodded, as if she knew what was running through my mind. But I felt wretched, having to stand here knowing what Dad had done, as the one in the firing line. At least where Rhett was concerned. You aren't your father, sweetheart. The woman lifted a tender love hair affectionately from my forehead. Everything happens for a reason. God makes sure of it. And I know why you were sent here now. She's here to hurt us, Ma? It's in her blood. I frowned challengingly at Rhett as he moved forwards, forgetting we had an audience. Sandwiching me against the side of his wooden abode, his unrelenting eyes bore into mine. I wasn't expecting that little violation, but it didn't faze me. Not after the gun in the back thing. There was something about his eyes. They weren't the welcoming, sincere orbs that I remembered. He must have been wearing contacts or something, because even though one eye was emerald green, the other was a sort of Caribbean blue. And he was every bit the scary bugger that his brother was the night before. Go home. Now hairs rose on the back of my neck, a shiver blitzing through me. But I locked my jaw and tried to pass him the most disinterested look I could muster. Behind us, Jeannie reacted. But I stilled her, holding out one palm to show her that I was okay. Bloody ignorant male. I pushed back at him, forcefully, stepping out from his grasp. I'm not going anywhere, Red. Get some sleep. We have some talking to do in the morning. Donna hooked her arm through mine, Jeannie strapped her arm around my shoulder again, and Tarquin passed Red a dirty look. Above all other emotions, I felt angry. I was still angry as Jeannie served blueberry pancakes and an array of sweet treats left over from the fair. Even the honey glazed, mouth-watering, beautifully iced confections couldn't distract my mood. But I stuffed my face nonetheless. I still had no idea what Rhett had been doing at the wedding, but his attitude last night irked me. It more than irked me. I felt like swatting him around the face with my flip-flops. Donna and Tarquin were oblivious to everyone else this morning. I watched as Don fed a piece of pancake through Tarquin's lips, which was, by all accounts, absolutely disgusting, but also really sweet and romantic. And I felt a familiar pang of jealousy. I didn't expect Rhett to join us for breakfast. I pictured him sitting at his oak table in the cabin, carving open an apple with a chainsaw. But he strolled in tight washed out gray tea, hugging his sculpted muscles and jeans tucked into open walking boots. I warned myself not to ogle the enemy, not to imagine myself licking his undulating abs. He positioned himself opposite me, eyes glinting, as he stabbed a pile of pancakes and placed them on the rose, printed shabby chic plate, in front of him. I narrowed my own eyes, thinking about what he'd inferred last night. That I was anything like my father. That I'd ever follow in his footsteps. That I'd ever harm these people. I'd never hurt anyone, let alone the Buells. Actually, scratch that. I'd leave the Buells alone, but I'd go after Rhett. If I thought Avery was hard work, he was nothing compared to his brother. Judgmental prick. So what do you have planned for today? Jeannie asked breezily, cutting through the tension that fogged the space between Rhett and I. Hopefully they'll pack up and leave town. Rasped Rhett, poking a strawberry, so hard that I winced. Poor strawberry. And hopefully you'll learn some manners, son. Jeannie whacked the back of his head with a tea towel and smiled down at Donna and Tark. I swallowed the snigger that threatened to end in Rhett hurling pancakes at me, or stabbing me, 
instead of that strawberry. I hear you two are going for a fishing trip, with Avery this morning Jeannie addressed the love birds, who were now sharing a slice of French toast. Vom! Oh, ill tag along, I said, quickly, hoping it wasn't too obvious that I wanted to put distance between myself and Rhett till I found a way to steal back what was mine. No room! Jeannie sighed regrettably, and I knew what she was doing. She looked between Rhett and I. He had angled himself away from the table now, like a sulky teen. And I fought every urge to kick him under the table. He wasn't anything like the vision I'd built up of him in my head. But then Scott wasn't exactly the loving, husband-material dream boat I'd once thought him to be. I need some help with the cattle today. She was speaking to Rhett, but her eyes strayed to mine. If you can bring yourself to put last night behind you. He smiled thinly. Give me a call when you need me. Ma. And he left, just like that. Arsehole. He's not always like this. I scrubbed a rose-printed plate, Jeannie beside me, drying mugs with a checkered cloth. It was one of those no-comment moments. Do you really care for my son? I swallowed, feeling an overwhelming tide of feeling creeping up on my periphery. Jeannie's hand landed between my shoulder blades. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have asked that she sounded sorry. Poor woman. I felt for her, having a lying, conning, angsty son. No. It's okay I put the sponge pad down on the edge of the sink. Can I ask you something? The older woman nodded her hand still on my back. And once again I felt this unexplainable sadness. It was my dad, wasn't it? He ruined your reputation. He took your home from you. He... I broke off because I didn't know what to say. And I felt guilt and pain for a family I was just getting to know and fury at my father for stealing away whatever future the Buells thought they'd have. Yes. She sighed, wistfully, but passed me a motherly smile. But that's not your burden to carry. Rhett holds his father on a pedestal, and I should have known really. A mother should know she paused, and instinctively I touched her arm. He's been carrying this all these years, and that's why he's been so distant and so lonely. Rhett. I found Samantha crouched beside Callie, one of our cows. My intentions were to avoid her till I'd gotten my head straight. Every time I thought I had my head under control, I saw her and lost it all. I needed air. Space. I needed her to leave. Callie was in discomfort, pacing around, as Mom talked Sam through assisting the birth. I loitered by the barn doors, wanting to help my mother, but simultaneously wanting to avoid Samantha. I should leave. Get in my old Buick and drive. If all Sam wanted was the photos, I'd never give them up. I didn't know her motives. Didn't trust her. You'll be okay, girly. Sam reached out hesitantly and stroked the side of Callie's face. It's rough being a woman. I feel your pain. Mom chuckled softly. They hadn't seen me, and even though my brain told me to leave, something else made me stay. So who's the daddy? I bet it's that sexy bull I saw on the way in here. You go, girl. Sam giggled, and the sound made me want to throw her against the corrugated metal wall and kiss her so hard she begged for air. A smile was dawning on my lips. One I tried to stem. Samantha gained in confidence, and Callie must have been soothed, because she moved closer to her. I need to go get some supplies, sweetie. You holler if you see the water sack. My mom gently patted the cow's back, getting to her feet. Sam's face crunched up in disgust, and then her expression softened as Callie sought comfort in her. Mom hurtled towards me, urgently seeking the supplies, pausing as she realized I'd been standing there, watching. She issued a don't-you-dare-mess-with-Samantha look and hurried to gather together her birthing gear. Men, E.Y., look at you suffering in here. 
That bull's probably strutting around out there. Maybe eyeing up some other unsuspecting female. And in nine months' time, she'll be in here too, cursing the day she met him. Sam stood up, and this time with more confidence, she stroked Callie's back. I'm useless with blokes. But then I find most women are bitchy, so I couldn't be a lesbian either. And cats hate me, so I'd be a pretty rubbish cat lady too. How depressing. I fought the urge to alert her of my presence. I was staking her out, wasn't I? Observing any weaknesses in order to use them later to my advantage. I listened to her talking to the cow, rambling about the sorry state of her life. Callie was becoming distressed now. I could hear it. It was either step in now, or I hope Mom could get back. I knew from experience that we might have a headgate situation, and Sam hadn't been here before. As much as I'd love to watch her flounder, it wasn't fair to Callie. Have you washed your hands? I marched towards the two of them, catching Sam by surprise. She let out a little yelp, and then tried to recover with an aloof expression. My hands are perfectly clean, and I have this under control. You think so? I said sarcastically, because I'd e bet that on the Belvedere estate, the most work you've ever done is lifting a fork to your lips. Samantha's jaw set hard. Her eyes flashed at me, fury bubbling there. I'd never wanted to kiss someone as much as I did then. You know absolutely nothing, you ignorant twat. Or perhaps I'll work it for the more Americanized. You're a jerk, Red? A jerk, I repeated, with a smile. Yes. And you don't know me. How dare you make assumptions about? She trailed off, and her eyes grew. That's the sack. I'm sure that's the sack I saw panic in her eyes her hand shaking against Callie's coat. The yellow water sack hung from Callie, the cow herself doing amazingly well. We have to see how the calf is positioned. I voiced. Move aside and let me find out. I can do it, her voice wobbled. I had no idea what she was doing or what she was trying to prove. Samantha, seriously, let someone experienced do this. Because you're better than me because I'm the little rich girl. Sam, seriously? We can discuss our thing after we deliver the calf, okay? Tell me what to do, she demanded. What? Tell me what to do. It can't be rocket science. I've seen people do this on zoo programs all the time. Samantha, I warned. Callie bucked, the change in my tone frightening her. As I moved towards her, she backed away. Toward Samantha. Just like my traitor of a dog. I had no choice. Fine. You're gonna need gloves. I pulled a pair from the dispenser on the wall, holding them out to her. She grabbed them without looking at me, her eyes fixed consonantly on the cow. And you're gonna need some lube. Some what now? Her cheeks glowed red, and I felt something inside me flutter. She had such thick lashes, perfectly porcelain skin and... Focus. Rat. Focus. Lube. I couldn't meet her eyes. I felt a blush blooming on my own skin, so I practically threw the tube at her. I saw the nerves as she put on a front to me, but she looked down at Callie with complete bewilderment. Here. I joined her, pulling on my own set of gloves and taking charge. I could feel that the calf was presenting backwards, and I knew we needed to act quickly. The rope over there, Sam. Get it. Right now. She did as she was told, this time without question. I secured the rope around the calf, ensuring I could feel the hooves, Callie's distress all too apparent. And that's when Sam started singing. Not a lullaby or a gentle love song, but Backstreet's Back. I was amazed. Whatever she was doing had the desired effect. With my hand on one side of the rope and Samantha holding the other, we helped Callie birth her first calf. I don't know if it is instinct or something Mom told her, but I hung back as Sam tickled the calf's nose and used the side of her T-shirt 
to clear away the residual amniotic fluid. Then she stepped backwards, as Mom bustled back into the barn with a bowl of fresh water and another bottle of lubricant. Samantha sat cross-legged on the floor, watching Callie bond with her baby, and I could barely drag my eyes away from her. Samantha! I felt a little shell-shocked, to be honest. I once read about a bloke who walked through the desert with two broken legs, defying all the odds. The reason he'd managed to push on was a case of mind over matter. And that pretty much summed up what I'd just been a part of. I'm no way near as squeamish as Donna is. She won't touch a raw chicken without wearing two pairs of marigolds and a dust mask. While the young calf suckled from his mother, Jeannie passed me a steaming hot mug of cocoa. You did wonderfully, didn't she, Rhett? He hung against the corrugated wall beside the barn doors, looking rugged, lick able and menacing, all at the same time. I ignored him and accepted her praise. I had to admit, it was rewarding the feeling that I'd been a part of something so organic. It was probably the only birth I'd ever be a part of, because I'd die childless and alone, and there's no way I'd ever want to be present for the birth of Donna and Tarquin's kids not when they had a high possibility of inheriting his nose. I chewed my lip, sitting on the hay-strewn floorboards, mug cradled in my palms. You don't have to prove yourself to anyone, you know, Jeannie murmured as she cleaned the floor. Least of all to my moody son. I looked over at him, and I remembered the pressure of his lips against mine. Instinctively, I tugged my lip with my teeth, and maybe it was the shadows in the barn, but I swear his eyes lingered a moment too long on my mouth. I wanted my photos back, but undeniably, I still wanted him. Sam. After Jeannie cleared up and Rhett sauntered off like the haughty childish bugger he was, I knew I needed a shower. I could smell cow on me, and it wasn't the finest aroma I'd ever smelled. I would say the whole experience had turned me into a vegetarian, being up close and personal to an animal, but I knew by the end of the day I'd be ready for a skyscraper high pile of beef in a bread bun. Relish optional. Tarquin and Donna were still on their romantic date, not exactly a gondola ride in Venice, but at least they were making something of my hair, brained idea, to come out here. And I did feel a little bad that the early days of their budding relationship were spent helping me find the photos, so I didn't look like the mess my parents and my sister were convinced I was. While I washed away the day and tried not to dwell on the fact that I'd just seen more bodily fluids than I ever wanted to see again, it came to me. I had to break into Rhett's cabin. The sooner I got those photos, the sooner we could leave. The sooner I'd be able to forget him and that Greek god-like body and the way he made heat pool inside me like I was Vesuvius about to blow. I concocted a plan, a self-revival mission. Internet dating was on the list, but this time I'd be Picare. I wasn't getting any younger, but I wasn't in the mood to waste time either. Time to put all my efforts into losing my spinster status. Brad and Angelina met a little later in life, and now they have a whole brood of kids. Not that I wanted a brood. One or two would do me. Well, I'd have one and then decide whether I wanted to put myself through the bother again. After watching poor Callie, childbirth was far less glamorous than in films and a lot less dignified. And it's not like I have a lot of dignity to start with. I practically tripped over Rocky as I left the bathroom, but nothing could stop me now. Dressed in black jeans, a black vest top, and black cowboy boots, I set off on my mission. And like Beyonce when she went solo, I was going to kick arse. The cabin was silent. I crawled in the bushes, praying none were poison ivy. I probably should have staked the place out first, identifying the shrubbery and any possible points of entry. But I needed Tarquin for that, and he was probably somewhere playing tonsil tennis with Donna. I shook that image from my head 
and ignored the fact that my arm stung. It had to be nettles. That's what it was. After circumnavigating the house, I realized the only way in was through the front door. I hadn't brought a credit card or a hair clip like they do in the films, so yet again, my spy skills were seriously lacking. He didn't appear to be home. No shadows lurked inside the cabin. Time to make my move. I gripped hold of the window ledge, hoisting myself up. I'd never scaled a building before, but it was easy. It had to be. Children climb trees all the time. And I watched a show about a man who climbed the Empire State Building without a harness. I could do this. There was an upstairs window ajar on a dropped roof. I could easily force it open further, push myself through Ransack Rhett's house, and be gone in a few minutes. Tarquin could sort the travel, and we'd be back home by breakfast time. I was only three feet off the ground, but I felt as if I was stranded a thousand meters from Earth. I couldn't bear to look down, even though, if I fell now the most likely injury would be a bruised arse. Then I saw the drainage pipe clipped to the side of the building. I could shimmy up it like Incy Wincy Spider. If I moved fast maybe it'd stay attached the building and not groan under my weight and land me in the prickliest bramble tree I'd ever seen. I heard Rocky woof from somewhere behind me and I took it as encouragement to continue. Singing Eye of the Tiger to myself, I dragged my weight behind me gripping the pipe with my thighs. Hands strapped around the circumference. I heard the squeaking of the plastic, like it was saying, please don't climb me you overgrown oaf, with a lot of panting, and arguing with myself, I was shocked to have reached the sloped rooftop. I pulled myself up onto the tiles, feeling that ugly, sweaty trickle down my back. But there wasn't any time to rest now. Crawling on my hands and knees, I stayed low. The tiles seemed pretty well stuck down, but then they'd only had birds perching up here, before, not size twelve chunky little women trying to commit burglary. The window was in reach. I grabbed the frame with box hands and suddenly realized what a twat I was. It seemed much smaller now. More like the size of a bathroom window, which explained why he'd left it open. Not even a five-year-old child would fit through it. Whimpering with defeat, I pushed at the glass. And it opened all the way. I had to try. I had no accurate way to measure my shoulders, so I did the best I could, using my palms as guidance. I once heard a DIY expert on daytime TV ramble on about measuring twice cutting once. So I applied a little caution, separating my hands, so I knew I had enough wiggle room. I lifted myself to standing, which was no easy job on a floor that felt like it might collapse any minute. Knowing my luck I'd wind up back in the gunroom. My head went through fine. Then my shoulders. And then? Then I ran into a problem. Rat. There was someone hanging out of my bedroom window. I knew that ass well enough. I'd been trying so hard not to stare at it this morning. Trying even harder not to imagine myself running my fingers down the small of her back and over those round, pert cheeks. From the way she was moving, she was stuck. I could see her feet scraping against the tiles as she tried to pull herself free. Oh, man. This was a Kodak moment. I laughed aloud, a huge, mountainous release leaving my body. As I got closer, the silence in the greenery only made this more perfect. I could hear her cursing. I even heard my name. I couldn't not smile. Hey, Sam. She had to know I was here. What was more mortifying than knowing I was there? Watching her struggle, flailing around like a fish out of water. She must have been grunting and moaning too loud to hear me. Sam. Hey. Want a hand there? Her body stiffened, and I threw the ladder I kept against the tree's flush to the cabin. There a reason why you're trespassing, Belvedere. It's an restable offense you know I reached the lowered roof 
and stepped up over the roofing tiles. You are. She was angry, I could tell. Even her arms were going red. Or maybe that was the lack of circulation on account of her being wedged in my window. I think I'll call Avery I mused. Oh, just perfect. Perfect. Have me locked up. And I'm not even the criminal here. That's real rich, hon, coming from you. You were a twat ret buell. I don't care why you were at the wedding. I don't care that you hate my dad. To be honest, he's not my best mate either. Give me my bloody effing photographs back. He'll give them back when you tell me exactly why you're here. What's wrong with you? I'm protecting my family. At least you have a bloody family. I stared at the back of her. She twisted slightly, groaning in pain. Yes, I'm a Belvedere. I'm so sorry that that makes me evil in your eyes. But I don't live like them. I have a dirty little flat. I eat baked beans on toast most nights because I'm so skint. And I'm an embarrassment to my family. I thought those photos would make them see that she stopped talking. I placed my arms around her waist. The contact made my legs buckle, because even if my mind couldn't remember that night, my hands could. Where her shirt was untucked, I could feel the satin softness of her, and as my fingers moved across her flesh, she issued a noise that made my body respond. Maybe she was pleading, either for me to stop or continue. Get off me, Red. Her voice was stern enough to tell me my advances weren't wanted. I didn't know what I was doing. I was so messed up over this woman. She twisted herself again, and I backed away as she freed herself. I could see red welts on one of her sides, raised skin abraded by the window frame. Keep the photos. She clenched her jaw and her arms across her body. I don't need to prove anything to anyone she moved away from me towards the ladder. Not to my jumped-up sister, or my bloody mother, who won't stop badgering me about getting married and having babies. And especially not my father who sees me as the dunce of the family. And you? Hey, race a little tip for you. If you keep hanging onto the past, you'll die in this crappy little cabin all alone. Let it go, Rhett. Your mother has. She leapt off the bottom of the ladder as I held it in position to save her from breaking her neck. Rocky raced figure of eights through her legs as she tried to make her getaway. I want to know your motive, Samantha. Humor me. I can take it. She spun around as my feet hit the dirt. What is wrong with you? You seemed so together before, and now you seem absolutely she racked her brains, clutching the sides of her face as if in pain. Psychotic. Psychotic. You're the one who who came halfway across the world to have another shot at ruining my family. I came for the effing photos, you moron. I woke up and you were gone. After the bloody best time I'd ever had. You stole my photos and you walked out on me. She stopped talking and her bottom lip wobbled. I watched her close her eyes like she was praying, issuing a mantra or singing a Backstreet Boys song to herself. I knew I was in love with her, from the cells in my toes to the synapses in my brain. She opened her eyes again, just as Rocky darted round her, and pushed open the front door to my cabin. It was open, she said, sounding hollow. I can't bloody believe it. The door was open the whole time. This time she laughed dryly. He was barking, he was trying to tell you. I explained. I can't do a thing right. What's wrong with me, Rhett? And then she decided against asking me. Don't answer that. I don't want any more stress for today. In fact, I'm heading home. Right now. Something inside me lurched. She stomped around me, those little cowboy boots biting her dirt, as she made her way along the path. Her hips swayed invitingly, even though I knew she was telling me to stay away, and for my sanity I probably should. And how are you gonna do that? I called out as my traitorous dog held tight to Samantha's side and passed me a look that I swear to God said he didn't know me. Don't you worry about me. 
the further from you and your gun room and your grudges, and, and your stupid she was cursing under her breath, marching purposefully, towards the lake. What was she doing? My grudges. This wasn't a grudge. This was a guy who spent his life trying to get justice for his father. Well, you know what? At least you had a father who cared about you. So don't expect me to get out my violin red. She was climbing into one of our boats. Tarquin and Donna had one. This was our only remaining rowing boat. Before I could wade into the water she and Rocky were disappearing, every stroke of her oar, more powerful than I thought was possible, coming from such a diminutive woman. She turned her head away from me, towards the sun, as she powered across the water. For a second, I was rooted to the spot, but I had a nagging tug in my stomach. This conversation wasn't over. I didn't want it to be over. Her cheeks were red. Even from here, I could see that. And then the sun caught the shimmer in her eyes. She was crying. That lurch again, strong enough to send my hand clutching for my heart as she rode away without a backwards glance. I walked aimlessly towards the tree line, one half of me telling myself to go home and hibernate for however long it took for me to get over Samantha. The other half of me wanted to find a boat and thrash it out with her, put whatever we had to bed for good. To bed. I swallowed as I remembered the way she looked, furiously hurtling from the ladder, trying to put distance between us. That feisty streak hadn't been an act back in Cairo. There was a fighting spirit inside her. The kind of fight someone adopted when the world was against them. And I knew it well. I gripped my fingernails inside my palms. Had I got this wrong, so wrong? What if she was estranged from her family? And what if she'd only come here to take back the photos? Photography was the one thing she knew she could do well. I froze feeling guilt seep into my veins. A sobering sensation. She hadn't known my identity, just as I hadn't known hers. Seeing her name badge in her hotel room sent my whole world spinning. She was no longer the sexy, clumsy, wonderfully weird woman I'd fallen for. She was an enemy, and I'd left her there, and my heart too. Hell. I had to turn back. I didn't have a boat, but I knew my arms and legs would suffice. Sam. I called out, her name echoing around the lake and filling my ears. As my boots touched the cold water I searched for her, my eyes scanning the lake. But I didn't see the boat. Surely she wasn't in Kent, that took even the most accomplished athletic rower at least forty-five minutes. But she wasn't on either side of the tree line. The boat would be sure there. There's no way she could drag it through the undergrowth. A cold chill spread like fire down my spine. Sam. Then I saw movement. Rocky, paddling towards the shore, mewling like a cat. And then the curved underside of my father's hand crafted boat. Rat. The water was cold. Where the trees fanned the lake with their branches, the umbrella effect meant the water below was far less than body temperature. My jeans stuck to my legs as I scrambled towards the upturned boat. I couldn't see Sam, and as I swam, aged shards of bark stabbed at me, and great tendrils of swampy lake growth pulled at my legs. Sam. I heard my voice, thick, hoarse, and urgent as I cursed the distance between me and the boat. Rocky had reached the shore and the poor dog howled, desperately trying to call aid. I grabbed the edge of the overturned boat, ducking under the water to keep a look out for her. But it was too murky, thick with green algae, dead vegetation and those vines that sniped at my ankles. Then I saw bubbles, froshy bubbles at the foot of the boat. And she surfaced. I heard a strangled cry, and she thrashed eyes terrified, hair stuck to her face. I went to her, my arms circling her waist, picking her up and holding her against me. She held fast to my neck, the sound of her teeth chattering against my cheek. Jeroff, she muttered, Jeroff. 
It took me a second to realize she was asking me to let go of her. But her body language betrayed her because she stuck to me like a limpet. Samantha, I was going to be sick. I don't recommend filling your lungs with lake water. It tastes like green, as in the color green, boggy and thick, and I spewed all over Rhett's shoulder. Bugger. He set me down, and I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Told you. I have no dignity. My eyes were stinging. I'd probably contracted some parasite from the algae-riddled water, and I could feel something slimy stuck to the back of my neck. I half expected him to recoil in disgust, maybe curse me for covering him in sick. Instead, he hooked his fingers under the hem and rolled off his t-shirt. Gulp. His body was hard, sculpted as if it had been molded to perfection, lines of muscle defining his abs. Sit down. I felt his hands on my shoulders, lowering me to a seated position on the loose dirt beside the lake. I couldn't avert my eyes. He held my chin in one hand, as my body shook with shock or something else. My tongue was limp in my mouth, incapable of putting together a sentence, as he checked my eyes, his finger moving in front of my face to observe my reactions. Then his fingers were on the back of my neck, and for a second it felt like he was massaging me. Then I saw the ugly black splodge he pulled off the back of my head. What happened? His fingers were on my wrist now, and I watched his tan digits fully encase my wrist. Holy hell! What do you think happened? I said, but it came out as some garbled nonsense. I tried to laugh it off, but I wound up coughing, and then the biggest snot bubble exploded from my nose. Any normal person would hull laughing, but he was too engrossed in checking my vitals. I could have died. Right there in the lake, a million miles from home. All because the arsehole wouldn't give me my photos back. It was your bloody dog. I was angry now. Angry and woozy. He saw a rabbit or something. I don't know. The dog's as daft as a bloody brush. And he flipped the boat. And then? I felt my forehead, which was difficult, because my nest of a barnet stuck fast to the skin but I could feel a ridge. I wanted to be sick again. Let me see that he murmured, eyes bloodshot from diving in and putting on the hero routine. I slapped him away, moving backwards in the dirt. Sam, you have to let me see that. Your dog flipped the boat. The boat hit me in the head, and I'm fine. Sam. He was impatient, jaw locked, his body absolute, cruel perfection. And then I passed out. Rat. Shiz concussed. Jerry Kellerman gripped my shoulder, smiling concernedly at her behind thick lenses. Jerry was one of Avera's friends, and the only doctor for miles around. Samantha lay in my bed, her arms strewn over the pillows, one leg thrust fitfully from the sheets. She looked so peaceful. Should she be sleeping? I could hear the anxiety in my voice, my tone rising half an octave, and I felt a cold, clammy shiver course through my bones. It's the adrenaline leaving her system, all that shock, and her injuries. My mind shot back to the moment, where Jerry had used shears to slit the material of her shirt, exposing her flawless skin, and then expansive bruising over her ribs. My lips ached with a yearning I hoped would pass. I wanted to feather kisses over her exposed flesh, reassure her that I was here. And I knew she'd push me away. A girl like her, fending for herself, never having had someone she could rely on before. I thought about Scott, walking away from the chance at building a life with her, and no matter how hard times were financially, there's no way in hell a real man would ever let go of her. Jerry left, lingering as if he was watching me, watching her. I thought about her wearing my jacket, wearing half a burnt dress, drinking whiskey and musing about past loves, kissing me the first time in the library. Mom stayed away, distracting Tarquin and Donna. 
Sam had slept for three hours, so far and maybe, selfishly, I wanted her to myself. One part of me felt like she shouldn't be here, and the other half felt like she was exactly where she was supposed to be. Because it felt right. I dated a local girl, Alison Sharman, for three years after high school. She didn't know what I did, so I told her I worked for an investment bank in Europe. I could remember being gone for weeks at a time, and only on the way home did I think about her. Usually it was a gnarling guilt. I didn't love Allison. I tried. She left me for Jerry Kellerman, the doctor. I didn't blame her, but all the same I felt hollow. Why couldn't I feel something? I wanted to be angry, to throw my beer glass at the wall, hunt Jerry down, and put up a fight for her. I thought about Sam, strolling in, whilst I worked on bringing down the firewalls on her father's server. She'd just come face to face with her ex-boyfriend. She was bleary-eyed, hell she'd just thrown up. I knew if I didn't do something fast, nothing in the world would erase her from my mind. Samantha. I heard the hum of the TV, and instantly I recognized the voice. Kim Kardashian was arguing with her mother, Chris, about her wedding plans. I'd seen this episode a few times before. I like to think I'm a little like Kim. A little less endowed in the buttocks area, a little more well endowed around the stomach, thighs, and hips. Well, we're both brunettes. As Kim threatened to move to her sister's house, I yawned, eyes fluttering open. Thank God I was home. The whole charade was a bad dream. I considered getting up, but my body felt weighed down, exhausted. I flopped one hand over the side of the bed, feeling for the bedside table, where I kept the remote. And something licked me. What the bloody hell? I recoiled, jumping up against the headboard, so hard that I hit my head on the wall. Rocky jumped on the bed, his huge body crushing my legs, and he looked up at me with his big watery brown eyes. This was not a dream. Where the frick was I? Are you okay? Red appeared, like a sexy apparition, concern etching his too handsome face. He wore a loose pair of navy shorts. No top. Christ. Why am I in your bed? I squeaked, rubbing the back of my head, and suddenly realizing the front of my head was throbbing too. Then it came to me. I closed my eyes, pinching the bridge of my nose. Did we have sex again, Red? Tell me we did not have sex. He chuckled, the warmth of his melody turning on my hormones instantly. You had an accident, Sam. Then why am I topless? I pulled off the sheets, staring in horror and embarrassment at my faded off-white bra. And that's when I remembered Rhett was standing a few feet away, copping an eyeful at my less-than-perky boobs. Stop staring. I lashed out covering myself up and knocking over a glass of water on the bedside table in the process. I'm a gentleman, you're safe with me. I saw the curling at the corner of his mouth, and coupled with the warmth in his eyes, I felt that tug. Stupid male. Why did I always fall for the worst of their species? I had a doctor check you over he had to cut your shirt off. He threw me a flannel shirt. I wasn't going to reach out and catch it. I didn't trust the sheet to stay put. That's when the boating fiasco came back to me. Rocky didn't move, he cocked his head to one side, watching me, and I couldn't resist stroking his head. He'd nearly killed me, spotting a rabbit that looked like lunch. I couldn't blame him. I once crashed my car when I saw a poster board advertising buy one get one free stakes. Turn around. I barked, grasping the shirt and biting my lip as I caught a waft of Rhett's cologne. Sam, you've got some serious bruising. Let me help. Oi, pervy MC Perverson. I'm fine. He turned his back, bracing one hand against the wall. Standing up wasn't easy. My legs felt like they were made of elastic, and my ribs groaned in protest. Blur. I groaned, letting the sheet fall. 
I tried to put my arm into the shirt without success. I couldn't move the other arm, stretching it made my ribs feel like someone was stepping on them. I tried again, this time adopting a contorted position that made me want to vomit all over the bed. This was not going to work. Then I dropped the bloody shirt. It felt to the ground, and I wanted to sob dramatically. I probably would have done if it wasn't for my injured ribs. Sam. I didn't realize I was crying, but then I felt a breeze filter through the window, and my cheek felt cold. Man up, Samantha. So you nearly drowned. And the man from your dreams is paces away, but you can't have him. And now you can't dress yourself. I give up, I groaned, feeling a tide of tears waiting in the wings. In a second, I'd be a blubbery snotty mess with ribs that felt like they'd been trampled on by elephants. Don't say that it'll keep my eyes shut and maybe I can help you. Rhett. She let me help her, begrudgingly. Not that it was easy. My eyes screamed at me to open them, to drink her in, every inch of her bare exposed flesh. My nerves had me dropping the shirt more than once before I managed to get her arm inside one of the holes. When your eyes are shut, your other senses come alive. I could hear her breathing, the way she hissed a breath between her teeth as I straightened the collar around her neck. The hitch of oxygen as I moved closer to her, trying to lift her other arm into place. She moaned in pain, so I stopped, pulling back. Physical pain clutched me. I wanted to hold her. So bad. I'm sorry, Sam. Ah, don't apologize. It was the dog's fault. No, I'm sorry about the I swallowed, feeling thickness in my throat as I remembered the venom with, which I held my pistol at the small of her back. I'm sorry that I, I don't I guess I don't. What was wrong with me? Stop talking. She coaxed, and for the first time, she sounded like the Sam I.D. first met. There was no hardness to her voice. What's done is done right. I shook my head instinctively, backing up against the bed frame and sitting down, clumsily. I can't walk in your shoes, and you can't walk in mine, so let's just forget everything. Hold up. I fished inside the pocket of my shorts, lifting out the USB device that I.D. spent the last hour putting together. Here. I pressed it into her palm. Samantha. It was obvious what he'd given me. The photos and a truce. Thank you. What else could I say? My brain wanted to scream out sweet nothings, to tell him I was madly, crazily in love with him. But my father had ruined whatever chance I had. Rhett nodded, and I realized how stupid it was. He'd seen me half-naked, while I was passed out on his bed, so what if he saw me in my bra? It wasn't like we had been anything, or would ever be something. Open your eyes, Rhett. I felt the burning of my cheeks as I said those words, and he blinked a few times, clearing his vision. Help me get dressed. Please, we have to leave. Tarquin looked solemn, his hands clasped, like he was praying over his immaculate navy suit. My eyes flitted between him and Donna. She wore a Holly Golightly style hat and a ridiculously over-the-top 50s style dress. They were either headed to an ostentatious celebrity funeral or a fancy dress party. I stood there shirt half-buttoned, Rhett crouched in front of me, still holding the fabric, the two of them having ambushed us. What's happened? Rhett stood up, his back muscles rippling, as he moved towards Tarquin to get the low down. I could have happily stood there all day, imagining myself nibbling on his taut, sinewy muscles. Hubba freaking hubba! Are we talking to him, Sammy dearest? Tarquin shot to me, hand on his hip. The last we heard he was responsible for nearly drowning you. It's fine. I muttered, impatiently. Sammy, we tried to be here, but Jeannie told us to stay at the house. I've been so worried Donna blustered, gripping a huge black satin, oversized clutch bag. They looked like they were in mourning. This wasn't going to be good news. Look, 
I'm fine. Just tell me, us, what's happened? Tarquin paced the bedroom floor. With every step I felt like slapping him more. Him and his overly dramatic displays. Rhett shot me an exasperated look, and I found myself smiling back at him. Elise sigh. Tarquin, I swear to God I started, before he got the message. Sammy, it seems that your father has stepped down. Stepped down. As in. I was confused. Very confused. He's relinquished all his assets and every one of his twelve companies. I felt my jaw drop open. I was sure my father was the type to work till the day he dropped dead. Morbid as it sounds, I imagined it to be during a corporate meeting. He had dozens of those a week. Or probably on one of his visits to the very young, very blonde women he liked to keep company with. I don't understand, is he ill? Tarquin shook his head and gestured towards Donna, who continued the story, almost as dramatically as Tarquin started it. They were a match made in heaven. Sam, your mother is now running the show. Tarquin spoke to her half an hour ago, and let's just say she gave us enough information for us to realize that Rhett here must have been working for her. He looked stunned. His hand rose to his bristly, stubbly chin and I wanted to snog the life out of him right then and there. She was my client, he murmured. Numbly. She's divorcing your father. Donna blurted, ignoring Rhett. This is, it's a lot of information. She needs help, Sammy. I can't turn my back on her, I'd forgotten. Tarquin was her sidekick. During dinner with them both, their friendship was obvious. But this was a shock even to him. She's asked me to step in. A CEO of the property business and the media relations business, but I won't go, if you know, you don't approve his cheeks reddened. This was a huge business proposition for him. He'd be set up for life if he wasn't already. And he deserved it. I'd seen how reliable he was. And I valued his friendship. I knew I always would. I blinked, lowering myself down to the floor. They all looked at me like I was a china doll, about to shatter into a million pieces. Sammy, I'm so sorry they're getting divorced, Donna murmured softly. We have to leave, Sherpish, Tarquin added. Rhett moved towards me, cautiously. He mirrored my position, sitting beside me, cross-legged. His hand snaked towards mine, and I felt him hook his little finger with mine, before covering my hand entirely with his. My body tremored as I remembered the sensation. It was familiar and yet absolutely more intimate than anything I'd felt before. I wanted to store this moment away and replay it on every rainy day for the rest of my life. I'm okay. Really? And yes, Tarquin, you have to go. I won't allow you to stay here. This is huge. He nodded reluctantly. And Donna, it'll stay here with you, sweetie? But I saw the way she looked over at Tarquin, and my heart jumped into my throat. Because I could see that she loved him. And she needed to be with him. No, no, it'll be fine. I'm sure Jeannie will take good care of me. You have to go, Donna. I can't, Sam. Don't be silly. It's you and I against the world, remember? I already feel terrible that I wasn't there today. And I'd feel terrible if you didn't go home and support the man you love. Blah. I hate emotional moments because I'm not a pretty crier and maybe Rhett made it worse by holding my hand. Or by being so close and yet so emotionally distant compared to the man I was starting to connect with during the wedding. Donna's eyes filled with tears, so mine did too, and Tarquin took a huge parachute-sized hanky from his pocket and blew it so loudly we all wound up laughing. I tried to stop, tears streaming down my face, ribs bright hot with pain. Rhett ran his thumb over my knuckles as I watched him sob with laughter. God, I loved him so much. Tarquin instructed the pilot to collect them from the cattle fields whilst I watched from Rhett's front door. It hurt too much to walk too far, 
and I knew Tarquin, would probably lead a really emotional farewell, even though I knew soon enough I'd be back in England, looking for a job, working extra shifts at the cafe, calling out the plumber for my dodgy sink. Ill head up to the house? You can have this place to yourself. A little more privacy Rhett stuffed his hands into the pockets of his old shorts, and I felt a thud in my chest once more. You can't, I muttered, stealing myself of the wave of emotions as the plane glided into the sky. I knew they'd both be waving maniacally, and I knew I'd miss them. Even Tarquin, you can't head back to the house, I explained to Red as he kicked up clouds of dust, the plane disappearing from sight. He'll probably get locked in your kill room. He raised his head, a boyish grin, there that melted me, I swooned hard. Even if he was the next Dexter, I use that room for work. Sometimes I need a gun. That's true. Corporate accounts are dangerous things. I couldn't help but smile back. I didn't want to, it just happened. I think you know I'm not an accountant. Oh, a banker. You don't say. I said playfully. His eyes. God, they were beautiful. I hack computer systems. I steal confidential information. So, you're a criminal. A really hot one. Was a criminal. I think I'm gonna stick around here for a while. Look after Callie and her baby, and my mom. I think she'd like that. She misses you. She told you that? She told me a lot I like her. She's trusting. She gives people a chance. I turned on my heels, hoping to hear Rhett's footsteps following me. My heart thrashed inside my aching chest as I wandered into the living room. I felt his presence behind me. Sammy. His voice was so low. So seductive, dripping with sexuality. I turned around, and he caught my hand, linking it with his. There was that emotion again, wrapping itself around my throat. I could barely breathe. It felt like I'd run a marathon, as his other arm coaxed me closer. I'm so sorry, Sammy. I should never have left you. I bit my lips so hard I tasted copper. His hand rose to cup my chin, the other resting at the small of my back. The way his palm moved had me imagining myself pinned beneath his weight, feathering my hands over his back. I don't even expect you to forgive me for being such a psycho, I offered, and my voice came out all choked and quiet. I wanted to hurl him onto the sofa, even in my battered condition, and mount him like a wanton cowgirl. He smiled sadly. I guess I've been hanging onto a law of crap. I know that feeling while I mused, and I touched his cheek, feeling the roughness of his stubble. I was so close I could see my reflection in his eyes. My heart. God, my heart. Trust that moment to be the one where I felt a mammoth yin coming on. The sort that opens up your jaw like a lion. He laughed, and I joined him, my fists landing on his chest, softly pummeling him there, the heat of him more comforting than the Kardashians and a bowl of soup on a cold day. I think you better head back to bed. His eyes were so dark, they no longer looked blue, all green.